Thank you very much, and swasti astu. This is something I'm really delighted to uh, use as a greeting because in India, we, we really can't use this. So I'm very delighted to be invited by uh, Semyos Pafa, and thank you, uh, Dr. Abakorn and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sam, uh, for uh, inviting me. And it's uh, been a long commitment, and I have uh, been through a lot of changes in the last six months. And uh, I'm so glad that I actually could manage to get here. Uh, just a little background before we start the presentation. Um, yeah, I think contextualizing this presentation would be important because it's a, a huge survey, and this is something uh, 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 takes a lot of um, planning and effort, and also because I noticed that the audience is really from various parts of uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia uh, with the different um, specializations. So it's important that uh, we, we highlight uh, what are the uh, considerations or what are the ground um, uh, concepts that are common and across the arts in South and Southeast Asia. And I'm also trained in classical dance, uh, and so I really appreciated the work uh, of the uh, in Institute uh, Seni Indonesia yesterday and the students of the Balinese dance and music. Um, and I also want to highlight the fact that architecture, paintings, sculpture, um, literature, uh, music, dance are all interrelated. And in the concept, I mean, going back to the Indic civilization, uh, so to say, uh, there has always been a communication or an expression as well as certain dynamics of uh, certain aesthetic principles which have always been common across the arts. And we are very delighted to see that in Southeast Asia, and you will also th see through this presentation, uh, that knowledge of one art form actually complements uh, the uh, understanding of the other. So this is my um, personal uh, 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 view, as well as as a professional uh, coming from performing arts and visual arts, uh, I have always maintained. And this has guided me in my research on uh, some aspects of uh, architecture, sculpture, painting, and uh, most recently through the museum experience, because I, have, I, wasn't, I was a dancer, I was an academic, and then I became a museum professional, and I've now again gone back to uh, teaching. Uh, I find that the journey, uh, the understanding across the media, actually, uh, while trying to display objects and tell something about it in say 50 words or 100 words to an audience who is um, completely not initiated in uh, that particular tradition of art or culture is a very difficult and a challenging um, prospect. And uh, so in the last um, probably 20 years, Ramayana has been a, a continuous theme, uh, which I will actually speak in the next uh, uh, lecture after tea break. But as requested by the center, um, by Simeo Spafa, I will focus in this particular presentation on Hindu iconography. And again, to speak about iconography, it's not going to be easy without talking about architecture. Because uh, iconography is a, is a very dry subject. If you don't connect it with the actual examples of architecture and sculpture, um, it, it is not easy to, uh, to understand. So I want to um, take you through some of the concepts before uh, we start looking at the visuals. Uh, I want to highlight uh, the difference between iconography, iconometry, iconology, and, hist and art history. Uh, then I will focus on temple architecture, different, art, uh, different forms or different uh, ground plans, and also focus on more specific details such as doorways, walls, windows, pediments, pillars, placement of sculpture in them. And why I would do that is because that's where you really need to uh, focus to understand iconography and the uh, uh, changing changes or uh, variations that come within a site, uh, within a period, and the interactions between regions through either cultural or political connections. Uh, then we will focus uh, on sculpture and I will highlight some of the important iconographies of uh, Hindu gods, such as Shiva, Vishnu, Durga, and so on. And also uh, some of these um, 
auspicious motives such as Nandi <coughs> or Garuda or Naga or Kinnara Kinnari, which actually are national, some of them are actually national symbols in Southeast Asia. So this is something really interesting and I thought I will highlight that uh, as we go along. So um, moving on to uh, the first topic about iconography, as most of you would understand, is, uh, is, is a field of study that enables you to understand the icon. What an icon is, which is usually a religious icon or an uh, image of a, a deity. And usually the deity's image is uh, uh, accompanies with attributes. So attributes of a deity will uh, help in identification or finding out the meaning of what that particular icon, uh, icon is all about. So it's, uh, iconography is actually a study of the various um, attributes of an icon and to understand its symbol, symbolism. But to do that, we also need to understand iconometry. And in all, uh, whether it is Christian art or whether it is Hindu art, Buddhist art or Jain art, uh, there's always a specific dimension given uh, by tradition. And this evolves, but in most traditional societies, the dimensions remain the same. Or more, more rightly to say is proportion remains the same. So in most Hindu iconographies, in the context of this lecture, the dimension of the deity should follow a certain mana pramana, which means a kind of a measurement. And the, the basic measurement in Hindu art is the size of the palm. And this is the basic unit of measurement. And usually, the basic unit of measurement will be seven times the size of the, 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 the deity's uh, height would be seven times the size of the palm. And so this is something which remains um, uh, throughout uh, a standard uh, or standardized uh, iconometry in the uh, representation of Hindu deities. Now, iconology is related to iconography. In, in what way? Iconology is a study of an icon and its evolution of its iconography over a period of time. So let's say when we look at images of Shiva, uh, I will show you images of Nataraja. So how has the iconography of Nataraja evolved over, say, 1,000 years in particular regions? So you can start from uh, Chola period, or you can look at uh, uh, a Nataraja in uh, Cham art, and you can look at it across a region, across a period, or between a region and a period. And the symbolism or the meaning that evolves or changes across the period of time is the study of iconology. And in Indian art, now we are moving into study of iconography. Uh, from iconography, we are moving into study of iconology. And this is the leap that has been made in the 20th century and the, uh, the last 20 years of uh, the recent uh, century by Indian scholars and art historians. So it has also become a very important part of the study of art history. Of course, art history is a very vast uh, topic. I won't be going into it right now, uh, but it is in the context of this lecture, iconography, iconometry, and iconology are really very important, which you will see as we go along. So let me start by showing you uh, some of the uh, structures, religious structures. And here you may wonder why am I showing you Buddhist architecture? Uh, this is a square bodhigara. Uh, which is from Amravati. It's on a relief uh, from a stupa, which has been removed and now kept in the Madras uh, Museum, Government Museum Madras. <clears throat> and it has a representation, if you look carefully, uh, of a throne. Of course, this is the, an iconic uh, phase of Buddhist art. So this is a Theravada phase where there's no image, but the throne represents the Buddha. And the structures are basically um, a kind of a pavilion on a, on, a, on a pillar. And you can also see on this throne, there's also the Bodhi tree behind. So this is a representation of Buddha's enlightenment. Uh, but the focus of this slide that I want to highlight here is the space. So basically, we start with a very early form of religious architecture or structure, which would have been common for Buddhist as well as for Hindu. Uh, but in Hindu art, there's no representation of a, 
uh, structural uh, uh, form or architecture, mainly because most of the Buddhist uh, Hindu practices at this time would have been of performance of Vedic rituals. So there was really no need for a congregational space or a veneration space. So most of the Hindu practices or religious practices would have happened in the open air or in temporary structures which did not require a kind of a design or an iconography. So this is one point. I also wanted to show you other types of architectures which come from, again, wood uh, and thatch. So these are very early representations in art on Buddhist reliefs talking about or illustrating to us the importance of architectural early forms of architecture. So this is a circular uh, garba, um, a bodhigara, which has a circular shape. Because early temples in, in India also have upsidal and circular shapes as well. Upsidal is like uh, an apse, or the, what they call the gaja prushthakar, means the back of the elephant. So it's also another shape of architecture that you get in uh, early period, around the beginning of uh, the um, Christian era or the current era. And you also find these gavaksha windows in early uh, architecture and tiered structures. So you already find in thatch and wood, like uh, um, um, timber architecture, two levels of uh, construction. This is yet another example of a bodhi tree enclosed in a structure which has three entrances. You can see three entrances here. And it also has a railing and a dome or a stupa, a stupi. And this is also one of, I'm showing this also because the earliest Dravidian architecture also has similar characteristics, which you will see very shortly. This is a piece in the Indian Museum, Calcutta, from a, a stupa site called Bharut in central India. So previous one, Amaravati, is from uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh in South India, uh, or Deccan, and this is from uh, further north in central India. And this is from Sanchi, which is also in central India. Uh, I'm just going to move a little faster here. Uh, this is a square uh, shape uh, architecture of, a, again, a, a shrine with a naga. So this is a yaksha cult or yaksha worship, as uh, Dr. Sam had also mentioned yesterday, uh, the worship of nature spirits. And you also know that at this time, uh, during the lifetime of Buddha, uh, it was Hinduism that was practiced. And again, Hinduism also has nature worship as a very important aspect of uh, um, uh, religious practice. And anyway, at this time, there's no concept of Hinduism. Uh, the term Hindu uh, doesn't arise until the uh, Islamic uh, invasion of India. Um, yeah, one more uh, example. Again, uh, the point I want to highlight is the tiered structures with gavaksha windows and a stupi, a rudimentary architectural form from Andhra Pradesh, which will be carried forward in Dravidian architecture, which I'm going to show you shortly. This is another uh, uh, pillared hall. It's called Sabhakar. means it's a very wide room with many pillars, and on the roof you have a up, uh, you have a what is called the wagon vaulted roof. So it's like a wagon shape, which has a very long, uh, elongated uh, form. And on the two sides also, it will have gavaksha windows like this. So this is a, also an early uh, congregational space, huh? sabhakar. It's not a temple. It's a place for uh, gathering and also for uh, worship and for chanting and lectures. Now moving into, um, sorry, uh, the uh, forms of uh, Hindu architecture. This is a very basic format uh, showing you different styles of um, structures, which are basically squarish uh, shaped uh, uh, cells. It's a single cell uh, uh, shrine or a temple. But what is important to remember is the superstructure or the shikara. And in India, we have three styles. And this is again classified in our, sculpture, in our Vastu Shastra texts, texts which deal with architecture. So this is called the Nagara Shikara, this is a Dravida Shikara, and this is the Vesara. Vesara means something which combines the qualities of Nagara and Dravida. And uh, geographically, um, Vesara is associated with Central India, and uh, sorry, Deccan, 
parts of, parts of Deccan and Orissa, uh, whereas Nagara is north and Dravida is south. So I'm, I'm giving you a very um, quick overview. This is something very simple, uh, but something that you can actually um, remember. Uh, and also to initiate whoever is not very familiar with temples, this is a very, again, a very simple basic plan of a temple. You have the entrance or the Mukha Mandapa or the Ardha Mandapa. Then there is the Mandapa. Then there's a Great Mandapa or the Maha Mandapa. And then you have a Antarala. So this, this conjoint is actually what is, joins the Mandapa with the Garbhagriha. And this number five is actually the Garbhagriha where the deity would be placed. And you also have a circumambulatory path called the Pradakshina Patha. This is something also uh, common in uh, Jain as well as the Buddhist architecture. Uh, and Garbhagriha is, some, is considered as a womb or a uh, center in which the most, which is a, the most sacred space of the temple. And the coming together of the spaces is actually uh, a, a very important uh, uh, concept to understand how uh, a temple actually is combining sacred and profane spaces. This is also something we heard yesterday in the context of Balinese architecture. So the threshold which is then crossed actually is differentiating between the sacred space and the profane space of a Hindu temple. Okay, I'm now moving into Southeast Asia and starting with examples of um, brick architecture because as what you saw earlier, we have timber, timber architectural examples from the Buddhist period, which would also have corresponded with Hindu structures, which have not survived. Um, but we come to the next phase between fourth and seventh century. It's parallel to, uh, to Central India also. And this is an example from Miso. It's a, again a very important uh, group of uh, temples uh, associated with Shiva. Uh, Bhadravarman is a ruler who has established these temples. And um, it has also a lingam. So I'm also going to talk about phallic worship in a, in a while. Uh, and also uh, highlighting what is actually the structure and the superstructure and how do they come together, how do they relate. And this is the shala roof, what I call the wagon vaulted roof. This is also something very commonly found in India, in central India around the same time. And so this is an example from Champa of the Champa period. Um, again, very important, prominent antarala, uh, but of course it has no mandapa. And the main hall or the main temple structure is actually the single cell um, um, Garbhagriha. I'm also bringing an example from Trakyu, which also has a, a group of temples with an entrance, which is also found in South India called Gopuram. And when you have a Gopuram and an enclosure wall, it becomes like a temple town or a whole complex of temples. This is a, uh, is a scheme that also evolves in India. And we are very delighted to see examples of that in um, Vietnam at this time. Uh, and to highlight that comparison, I'm bringing here an example from the Kanchipuram um, Kailashna temple uh, of uh, first half of eighth century, which again has a wall, enclosure wall, a gateway, a gopuram, and a vimana, which is the main shrine, main shrikara, under which the Garbhagriha stands. And this is the plan of Kailashna temple. But the point I want to highlight right away is that there's no, no similarity in Southeast Asia and in Southeast, South Asia at this time. So even though the concept may have evolved from South Asia, but the way the charm architects and builders have adopted uh, the architecture is completely different. So here, these are the various shrines. So this is the boundary wall, but the boundary wall has actually shrines. And each one has lingam inside it. And then you have the to mandapas and the uh, garbhagriha. Now focus on the arrangement of this garbhagriha, the plan of the garbhagriha. And that is where I want to focus and draw the similarities. So the similarities are in the ar arrangement of a square ground plan. The square, square has nine by nine square. So they make 81 uh, squares. And this is called the sarvato bhadra or the symmetrical 
base or uh, ground plan for a temple. And this is considered in Indian tradition or Hindu tradition the ideal form for a temple. And now you will see a number of examples of the Sarvatobhadra plan. This is from uh, Miso. Uh, again, you can see the Sarvatobhadra with orientation on two sides and the lingam in the center. Um, yet another example of a brick temple which can draw comparison closely with Miso is Bittergaon in central India. Again, the ground plan of this temple is symmetrical following what is called the Sarvatobhadra plan. And you can also see uh, smaller um, niches in which sculptures are going to appear. So do keep in mind where sculpture appears in Indian uh, temple architecture and how the tiered roof with um, what we call the Ratha Pratiratha. This is a typical plan also of a North Indian or the Nagara Shikara is evolving at this time. This is a very key example, uh, one for brick structure, construction in brick, two for formation of Nagara architecture, beginning of Nagara architecture, and the symmetrical ground plan which we saw here. I also bring in uh, another example at this time of, of Chandi Bhima from uh, the Dieng Plateau, which also recalls very closely the Bittergaon and the Mison uh, temples in the planning as well as in the arrangement of the walls and the shikhara with the gavaksa windows. But it has a very important uh, additional item, which is a torana, which is the entrance gateway, which was not there in Bittergaon. It has already been um, broken, but so we are not able to visualize how it would have been um, designed and what it would have looked like. Now, focus on this. Uh, this is a, a image of Chandi Arjuna from Dieng Plateau. And I'm going to show you, oh, sorry. Before we move to, to that, uh, let's see the, um, I want to go back to the um, Sarvatobhadra again, since in Bali, people are interested in rituals. So this is a ritual um, diagram of the Sarvatobhadra plan. And um, this is what is used in architecture in Vastu. Uh, this is what the Vastu will look in a diagrammatic form using various colors as coding to identify the various spaces. Each of these space is associated with Vedic gods. So they have a designated space in these uh, uh, boxes or in the squares. And the Vastu Purusha, considered to be the sacred, um, uh, sacred uh, um, protector of a building uh, called the Vastu Purusha, actually resides in this, uh, in this square. Uh, so uh, this is also something which is um, abstract, but uh, has a strong belief, and most Hindus even today believe in uh, performing uh, prayers before any new building is uh, constructed. Even when we built the Indian Heritage Center, we performed the Vastu uh, prayers uh, in, uh, to, to ensure that the, uh, the gods protecting the land will be appeased. And this is a ritual prayer in the Hindu um, tradition. Uh, it's a prayer for the Nava Grahas, the nine planets. And again, each one has a different color uh, associated with it. And the placement of the various deities in this uh, particular uh, plan or in this particular diagram has a, a auspicious meaning associated with it. And this will help fulfill the prayer once it is uh, conducted in the uh, in the proper way. Do also notice the four kalashas or the pots which are placed on the four corners and one in the center. Now this is also leading to uh, the concept of the panchayatana or the five, uh, uh, five gods or five religious principles uh, which is also the cause, uh, the, the, the background uh, on which most of the temples in Southeast Asia are also evolving of what is called the Hindu or the Sanatana Dharma. Center usually will be Shiva, and then you will have Ganesha, Devi, or the Mother Goddess, uh, and other two deities could be Brahma and Vishnu. So the concept of Trimurti is joined by Ganesha and Uma or Durga to form the Panchayatana concept. And most of the early temples in Southeast Asia are also based on the Panchayatana format. Okay, oh, no. I, 
the yet another point that I wanted to mention was about temple architectural texts. <clears throat> the earliest uh, architectural texts, uh, such as the Vishnu Dharmuttar Puran, mentions the importance of the symbolism of human body uh, parallel the body of the temple, that it's a, actually a reflection. So since temples are, an, are a creation, it's, are a man-made creation, the philosophy that is behind this is also associated with the human world. Although it's a sanctuary for the divine, it also follows the structure of the human body. So for your, uh, for your understanding, you can look at this diagram, which is actually showing the human body on one side and the temple tower on the other. And <clears throat> starting with the feet, to the thighs, to the trunk, to the neck, you can see there are parallels which are drawn with the various parts of the temple and the parts of the human body. Okay, so now we come to the um, architecture from South India, and this is a very important, um, um, uh, like a watershed in the architectural uh, planning of uh, Dravidian temple architecture in South India from the 6th, 7th century. So the Pallavas were the earliest builders of temples. They were Hindus, and they built in rock-cut uh, natural, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, locations. So they built their temples in, uh, uh, on hills, on mountains. They cut into the rock and built their architecture. And this is the first time you see three-dimensional freestanding temples on a shore in, in um, very close to Chennai uh, in Tamil Nadu on the, what is called the eastern coast or the Coromandel coast. And these are actually made out of one rock. So these are not structural temples. They have been carved from the top to the bottom. So imagine the ingenuity in the proportions and planning. First of all, selection of the stone as well as the carving. So at the time you carved a stupi, the top, you have to know the proportion of every other limb of the temple when you come down. So this is something that is evolving in the 6th, 7th century. Not only here, there are many other sites in India, such as Ajanta, Elora, uh, in uh, Maharashtra, uh, these uh, sites in Tamil Nadu uh, during the Chola period, and also Pandya architecture in Kalugumalai in down south. So rock-cut architecture is yet another important aspect of Indian temple architecture, and the best example of this can be seen at Mamalapuram. And I want to highlight again here, look at the elephant and look at the back of this temple. This is called the Upsidal or the Gajaprishtakar temple. This is the wagon voltage structure. This is the typical Dravidian uh, stupi with one uh, or two level tiers and stupi with three tiers. This is a typical architecture which, as we saw in the Dieng Plateau, we also find similar examples. So new research is now being done by scholars, younger scholars, who are highlighting that uh, there are sporadic similarities between architectures of different regions of India, and we don't need to lo look at uh, grand schemes or grand plans or grand uh, patronage by uh, you know powerful ruler for this kind of exchange of ideas to happen. It can happen at a very uh, low key, you know, artist to artist or a group of people from India to Southeast Asia. It can be, the exchange can happen at a very um, uh, basic or under, uh, common man level. Because we can see examples through architectural style of the exchange of uh, ideas and concepts. So this is the typical uh, structure of a temple in, uh, uh, in, in Mahabalipuram. Uh, this is uh, the tower, the, 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 the plinth, or what we call the jagati, uh, the pillars, the stambhas, and the superstructure, which starts here, and ends with a surmounted stupi, which is the uh, finial, and which finishes off the, uh, the, the, the top level of the uh, temple. And you can see that being followed in most of the early architecture from the uh, Mahabalipuram, and that is 7th, 8th century. Now coming to uh, this 
similar architecture in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. We have examples again of the, uh, I'm going back to the Sarvatobhadra plan, sorry. So uh, moving on to the, the balanced uh, or the uh, um, symmetrical formatting or the planning or ground plan of the architecture. Here is an example of Angkor Wat, uh, Borobudur, uh, Thaprom, and uh, a closer view of uh, Angkor Wat again, which also shows the placement of the different narratives of Hindu mythology within the precinct of the uh, temples. And that, then from there, we move into the uh, different uh, superstructures and styles of superstructures, uh, which connects us with the Mahabalipuram example that we just saw. So here I'm drawing comparison between uh, Prambanan uh, and the, uh, the Vimana of the big temple, uh, Brihadeshwara temple in Tanjaur. So many of the forms appear similar, but most often the Southeast Asian uh, architects have taken a more summary view. So when you look closely at Southeast Asian towers, they look similar, but they are not exactly alike. Uh, then we move on to uh, another type of uh, layout and planning, which I find is again uh, connected with the Panchayatana or the five day tea uh, plan. Uh, this is Bantesrai, which also has uh, parallel um, uh, superstructures and also placement of five deities in the five shrines. And this is also connected uh, with architectural forms, of, say for example at Prasad Ka uh, Kravan in Angkor Wat, which also follows a similar design for the superstructure as well as the layout of the Panchayatana deities from Sindri. And um, connecting again, more, more uh, similar uh, outlook of the temple uh, frontage, which is the uh, Shikara, sorry, the Shikara and the uh, Shukanasa, which is sitting on top of the uh, main entrance doorway, also is connected with the uh, examples that come from uh, North India. So this I want to highlight. In Champa, we have what is called the Vesara style where the superstructure has uh, South, uh, South Indian or Dravidian features, but the entrance doorway has the more North Indian or the Nagara features. So these are some comparisons that we can draw between uh, how elements from both North and South get absorbed and something totally new or different is created, such as in um, this example from Pok, uh, Poklongarai in uh, Pan, pan rang. A similar example of a very prominent Shukanasa sitting on top of the entrance doorway in two tiers with a big shikara that relates very closely with uh, the temples in uh, Tamil Nadu, the Tanjore temple is uh, from the Khorat plateau. Uh, so I bring one example here to highlight that. But again, as you notice, uh, the, the way the sculptures are placed, uh, the walls are treated, they are quite different from uh, not from the uh, Tanjaur example. Here, there's very little sculpture. Uh, there are more windows and pillars, and mo most of the emphasis of sculptural decoration is on the entrance doorway and the tympanums above. So do notice that there are elements which look alike, but are very completely differently treated uh, by the uh, artists, say for example, in uh, Thailand here. I mean, this is, of course, Khmer architecture in Thailand. And the prominence given to features like Nagas, which we don't find in South India at all. So do notice how elements are individually going to be picked up and highlighted by the uh, designers, planners, architects uh, in Southeast Asia, which are going to be very different and look completely uh, unique to the region of Southeast Asia. And this particular example, uh, again, I want to highlight here the Bayon, which is a Buddhist architecture uh, built by Jayavarman the seventh. Here again, the Bayon is planned on the basis of the Sarvatobhadra symmetrical plan. So again, the idea of Sarvatobhadra is not only Hindu, it is also absorbed in Buddhist and Jain architecture. Um, while talking about this temple tower, 
I want to also go back a few slides, sorry about that, to the temple towers in uh, South India. Now this is a very, very prominent temple tower called Gopuram in Dravidian architecture. And I also show the plan of the um, temple. Uh, Meenakshi Madurai is a very important uh, Hindu, uh, Hindu temple in South India, in Tamil Nadu. So this soaring height that em uh, sort of emerges uh, in temple construction uh, with phenomenally uh, tall gopurams and phenom phenomenally tall vimanas or the shikara of the temple is a feature that comes around the 10th, 11th century and continues for about 13th, 14th. It's also parallel in Southeast Asia, but again the format and the form that it takes is very, very different. And I also want to uh, bring to your attention the comparison of this uh, enclosure or what we call the Gopuram walls uh, within which the temple is laid out are completely different compared to the temple precincts that uh, emerge in say um, uh, Prambanan, uh, Borobudur or even for that matter um, uh, Angkor Wat. So again the use of the wall and the use of spaces within an enclosure and a moat are completely different in South India and in Southeast Asia. So now focusing on the um, efflorescence of sculpture in uh, the, the Dravidian uh, Gopuram, you have another example from Bali, which is a completely similar look uh, or shape or form, but it has been completely treated in a different way. First, it has been split open and it has been divided and there's no uh, structure or uh, uh, like a wagon vaulted roof that goes on top like you find in South India. So this shala or wagon vault is missing in, um, in, in Bali and this whole space has been actually divided up to look like a uh, two, two halves, kind of symmetrical but two halves. So this is something unique about uh, the way the Gopuram has been adapted in Balinese architecture. <clears throat> I, I have one example from uh, Chhattisgarh, uh, from, uh, which is close to Orissa, also going back in uh, linking with the Cham brick temples and the Pitagao Central India temple architecture, which again brings to attention how uh, possibly uh, the style of building in brick could have traveled to Southeast Asia from Orissa rather than from Central India. Although this is all uh, an, an, uh, a, a speculative exercise, but visually you can see there are many similarities and comparison can be easily drawn, including uh, the construction technology or the method of construction. Yeah, so going back to um, uh, Angkor Thom, I thought this is a very interesting uh, comparison to draw with the soar, uh, soaring height of uh, temple gopurams in, uh, in South India, in uh, uh, Dravidian architecture, where actually uh, here they have limited the height and instead of uh, adding sculptures and different tiers uh, in a diminishing order, uh, they have actually introduced faces of uh, either Avalokiteshwara or Bodhisattva, uh, which have a similarity with the appearance of uh, Jayavarman the seventh. So this has a completely different orientation, a completely different motivation for which this uh, temple has been constructed compared to the Hindu temples, which were built uh, for um, a religious purpose where most kings would never even appear in uh, any form, uh, even uh, as a decorative uh, design or even in the likeness of any of the kings. So this is something very unique again to Southeast Asia and to the reign of Jayavarman the seventh. And we also find that most of the uh, kings in, uh, in, in South India, if at all they appear, they appear as donor. So you always find a sculpture of a a uh, king as a donor rather than as a, uh, you know, uh, impersonating the divine character of the Devaraja or the Bodhisattva or the Avalokiteshvara. So again, the motivation and the visual uh, form are uh, taking a completely different uh, direction. 
uh, again, I bring, I end this uh, uh, section on architecture with this example from Somnathpur in uh, Karnataka because I didn't mention anything about uh, Karnataka architecture, which is also very important in uh, South, in South India around the 12th, 13th century. Again, we have temples with enclosed enclosure walls and three uh, uh, three shrines or three garbagrihas with the cruciform or the uh, Sarvatobhadra plan. So the point I'm making is whether it is um, 5th century or whether it is 13th century, whether it's Buddhist, Jain or Hindu, the Sarvatobhadra plan kind of continues uh, systematically and uh, continuously in inspiring the building of traditional um, religious structures in um, India. Now we move to the iconography section where I want to highlight uh, deities which are placed in the Garbhagriha and deities which are placed on the walls, pillars, niches, ceiling, shikhara, gavaksha, and so on and so forth. So there's a completely different context. When the deity is placed in the Garbhagriha, it is meant for offering worship and for chanting and for ritual purpose whereas the placement of icons on different parts of the temple are only to add auspicious value, uh, auspicious um, uh, meaning, and to lend um, a strength or power uh, to the architecture, to the structure. So do notice when you go to a museum, uh, when you look at a sculpture, ask yourself where would it have come from? I'm very interested in context, and I always like to point out this aspect of uh, when you visit a, even um, a museum or a cultural center or even a new site in, in say any part of Asia, context makes it very relevant in order to un understand and appreciate the motivation behind the making of uh, an art form. So here you have two examples uh, from um, Cham. Uh, I'm so delighted that the curator from Cham uh, Museum is here. Um, so, uh, um, Shaivism uh, has a very important uh, context in Southeast Asia, which I will speak in the next session, which is on uh, Indianization, but I'll just bring the context here, uh, just so that we can highlight uh, the fact that the early iconography that arrives in Southeast Asia is Shaivite. And Shaivism is one of the oldest um, concepts of Hinduism, which uh, reaches Southeast Asia. Of course, the concept of the three murti, the three principles is, is an important uh, aspect as well. We will elaborate that in the next uh, lecture, but for now, uh, I want to bring to your attention the lingam, uh, which follows exactly the same principle as in, in India. It has three parts. One is um, cylindrical or round, one is octagonal, and one is squarish. So each of these are actually associated with the Trimurti. So the base or the square is Brahma part, the octagonal, the middle is Vishnu part, and the one on top, which actually is what is exposed and what is worshiped, this part is actually embedded below the ground. You don't ever see it, except in a museum. And this is the Shiva part or the Rudra part. And uh, in the uh, concept, again, of uh, Hindu philosophy, he, uh, uh, um, Brahma symbolizes srishti, or creation. Uh, Vishnu symbolizes sthiti, uh, preservation. And Shiva, or Rudra, uh, symbolizes uh, destruction, or what is called dissolution. Because in Hindu concept, the world never ends, or doesn't come to an end, it just continues. Um, so there's this uh, role that is given to the three uh, Hindu deities, the major three Hindu deities, and we are very delighted that both Cham and Khmer's have actually adopted the exact same symbolism in uh, the creation of the Lingam and the worship of Shiva, obviously. This is a, another unique example, which only exists in Cham uh, region, and in the short period between probably the fifth and the eighth and ninth centuries, uh, where the this is actually, if you look closely, there is a lingam at the inside, and there is a cover. This is a cover which is made of silver, 
and this head is actually the head of Shiva, is the, uh, this, this um, uh, practice of uh, covering the uh, Shiva Lingam uh, with uh, kosha or a cover is called Mukha Linga. And this makes a very interesting um, variation of uh, Lingam worship. And in, in India, as well as in um, Khmer and Cham, you have Eka Mukha Linga and Chatur Mukha Linga. There can be even four faces uh, uh, associated to the Lingam, uh, which all symbolizes the various aspects of Shiva's uh, personality, which uh, we can't go into right now. But this is a very unique uh, example of uh, Shiva's uh, identity or symbolism de developed by the charm artist. And it's a very exotic uh, and fine piece. There's another large lingam with a yoni peat with, with dancers below it uh, and a very large uh, pita. Pita is like the uh, pedestal. Uh, and this is the yoni and this is the lingam. Uh, lingam, as um, you also understand, and uh, Dr. Sam showed yes, uh, in his presentation yesterday, goes back all the way to Indus Valley, where you find Shiva's representation as proto-Shiva or as a yogi with uh, erect phallus. And this is uh, the symbolism of uh, Shiva, which has been combined with the concept of Rudra, the god of destruction. And it has been absorbed in various uh, cultures outside of India, including in uh, Cham. And the Shiva worship is also associated with dance and music. So I want to also slowly introduce the concept of uh, dance and music as a not just entertainment, but as a form of worship, uh, which is also something that uh, carries on from the Indian tradition into Southeast Asian tradition. Now, this is a four-armed Shiva from Thapnam, much later example, but you start noticing the various um, uh, multiple arms and various ayudas or attributes. So this is a spear, trident, and he also has the third eye, and he's also in a dancing form or dancing pose. Um, this is a very interesting Nataraja, and I have uh, brought some comparative material to show how mythological uh, scenes are depicted. Uh, so this is actually a scene from Sh uh, Shaivite Purana, which shows uh, Shiva as a performer, as a dancer. And here he is shown as a Nataraja in a dance pose. So this is a typical uh, dance pose called the um, uh, Lalita and Chatura. So depending on whether he is lifting the right leg or the left leg, the earliest forms of Shiva Nataraja would be in the Lalita or the Chatura. But what is unique about um, the Cham artist is that he has made Shiva with multiple arms. Uh, normally, you have four arms in, in South Indian Natarajas, but here you have uh, several arms. But what he does not show uh, is um, the various attributes. So this is an early example of uh, Nataraja from um, uh, a site in, uh, in, in Karnataka called Badami. Uh, so before Nataraja becomes popular in the Pallava and Chola art, you have uh, earliest example of Shiva as holding the Lalita or the Chatura uh, pose from Deccan uh, in Chalukya period. And so it is very important to note that the uh, Cham Nataraja is also something that would have been the uh, influence from Chalukya and not so much from the Pala or Pallava, which we generally associate with um, uh, for Southeast, contact with Southeast Asia. Uh, and before moving into uh, other iconographies, I also want to highlight the phallic symbol. Uh, this is from Orissa. And this is a Shivalinga, which is actually freestanding. It's outside the temple. You can see here the photo. Uh, the temple is uh, also very unique. It has a very different mandapa, and the entire wall has been used for decoration, which is something unique to Odisha. And on the Shukanasa, which is the top of the Shikara, here, right above the main entrance, is another representation of the same Nataraja in the Chatura Lalita form. So this is the earliest representations of uh, 
Shivalinga, uh, Shiva as Nataraja, the, uh, the king of dance uh, in um, temple architecture. And also we find examples from uh, charm art of the same period, or a similar iconography, but of a slightly later period. There are other representations of Shiva with multiple heads, with the trident uh, and the rosary, uh, which again uh, we find um, from the charm uh, period. Uh, this is Brahma. You can see the various heads here. That's how you identify Brahma. He has multiple heads. Actually, he has four heads, but you only see three. The fourth one is um, not visible. This is Nandi, the vehicle of Shiva. He is usually placed in any Hindu temple opposite the Garbhagriha. So when you enter the Mandapa and you walk towards the Garbhagriha, you will see the Nandi first and then the Shivalinga. So Nandi is like his vehicle. And he has also been pers personal, personified as Shiva's, um, uh, Shiva's uh, assistant. And he's also a, uh, an expert of music, dance. Ganesha, of course, everyone's familiar with. Uh, again, a very important charm, Ganesha. You have both examples, seated and standing ones, uh, with, uh, with uh, Ganesha's um, uh, um, trunk uh, eating the sweetmeats. So before the elaborate uh, iconography of his uh, various uh, arms and what he hands in the holds in the arms, the most important iconography that has been picked up by the charm artist is his um, fondness for sweetmeats. And because he's a Shaivite deity, he also wears a uh, naga on his uh, around his uh, trunk, which also you find very unique, um, and the, the dhoti or the uh, lower garment that he's tied around, he also has a uh, tiger skin, which is also an attribute of Shiva. So because Ganesha is the son of Shiva, he also has Shaivite attributes, which you can identify. Although this is a very charm way of uh, tying the dhoti, but the uh, skin of the tiger is something that I found very unique in this sculpture. Um, moving on to uh, Ganesha's popularity, we actually have very, uh, very good examples from Sri Vijaya period and Angkor Wat as well, uh, where he has a crown and a matted hair, like the Jata of Shiva. Again, Shaivite attribute. And ho um, again, um, uh, eating the sweetmeats. But this time, you have the additional arms, the two uh, arms in the back which are holding uh, attributes of um, uh, an axe and a noose. Um, yet another example of Ganesha, uh, this is from Bujang Valley, uh, from the um, museum in uh, Keda. So this is a unique example we have come across of early Chola period uh, style, uh, but made in uh, by local artists. And this is a Chola uh, Ganesha from the Indian Heritage Center, which we acquired uh, to show the comparison in the way the, the image uh, of Ganesha is treated with his pot belly. And here, of course, you have the rat or the mouse, which is his uh, vehicle, something that uh, is unique to uh, Hindu iconography. Um, Moving on to other iconographies like, uh, oh yeah, I have two more examples of Nataraja from Cham. Um, again, uh, showing uh, very close to uh, the mythological text. So here you can actually see the iconography followed by the artist is very, very close to the uh, iconography in the text where um, uh, what, what happens is that Shiva has a uh, a very uh, dear uh, or a very passionate follower or a devotee called Bringi. And uh, there is a story in the context of Shiva's form as Ardhanarishwara, half man, half uh, woman. Uh, Bringi gets so jealous of um, um, uh, uh, Parvati, who tries to fuse her body with Shiva's body, that he makes a hole between the two and starts dancing around Shiva. So this is the story of Bringi, who's usually shown as a uh, skeleton. So uh, looking at this sculpture, I can easily identify that whoever made this or whoever uh, guided the sculptors to carve this statue knows the Shiva Puran very well. 
uh, more images uh, which I won't go into details, but I, as I said, I will highlight the importance of auspicious uh, symbols such as Garuda in uh, iconography in Southeast Asia. Garuda has a very important place and how in uh, Vaishnava iconography, which is actually something that evolves uh, much later in Southeast Asia after uh, the, the impact of Shaivism, which lasts for many centuries, is something that uh, is worth exploring, worth uh, understanding, and how uh, Garuda has been uh, adopted in Thai and Indonesian uh, and Cambodian and Cham uh, architecture, including in their national symbols, uh, is something that um, uh, is worth, worth understanding and exploring. Like what is its cultural impact on these societies and how and why do they keep reiterating this motif in their uh, national symbolism. So I move on to Vishnu. The next <coughs> important uh, Hindu deity. Uh, and the reclining form of Vishnu, Vishnu as a uh, Shesha Shai, uh, this is a fifth century um, sculpture from a very early temple called Devgarh in central India. And this is a niche statue. So it is not in the Garbhagriha, but in the external, exterior wall of the temple. And besides its uh, importance as a um, uh, definer or demarcator of the popularity of Vaishnava worship or Vishnu worship. It also again symbolizes the significance of Vishnu as the god of preservation. And in charm art also you find Vishnu reclining on the Shesha but you also find Garuda on the two sides and Brahma emerging from the from the lotus that grows from his navel and on which he creates Brahma, who then creates uh, um, humans and the, the natural world. So it's a very interesting linkage that you see between Vishnu and Brahma. The same thing you see here also. Here there is Lakshmi, the, uh, the, the consort or the spouse of Vishnu, which is actually missing in uh, the charm. Or maybe she's there in the back, but because of the uh, shadow, I can't see it. Okay, and I have two very interesting examples uh, from Angkor Wat style in Thailand, where again the importance of Vishnu has been established. Again, you can see the Shesha Shai Vishnu here, and Brahma emerging from the uh, lotus uh, and starting the creation. Here you can see Vishnu and uh, Lakshmi seated. Uh, the most prominent uh, are the uh, various uh, acolytes and also devotees or assistants of the various um, of the gods that are in assistance here um, for Vishnu that also shows Vishnu as a god uh, who is a king. So the connections between royalty and the connection between uh, God is something that is beginning to get established in Southeast Asia and when we look at Ramayana we will see the connection where the Devaraja cult uh, moves from Shaivite uh, association to Vaishnavite association and how Rama is becoming an ideal of a king in the Thai culture or even in uh, Khmer culture. This is another example of Vishnu holding court uh, where he has uh, several monkeys and he's seated on a throne and architecturally you can see it being placed on a very prominent door of a temple. Uh, therefore, it also commands uh, a sort of uh, importance in the context of Vaishnavism in Southeast Asia. Now I'm moving away from religion and bringing some examples of everyday life and for celebration as well as to show how dance and music are integral to religious worship and religious life of people in uh, Southeast Asia. These are examples of charm art. Uh, again, you can see uh, people playing music and dancers performing in the Anjali Mudra. This is the Anjali Mudra, which is a very important um, greeting mudra or venerating mudra. Also Hindu and Buddhist both share this. Um, and these are, um, again, 
um, dance-like poses which can be identified through Natyashastra vocabulary uh, of a, what is called warrior pose. And these are actually uh, caryatids that are supporting the superstructure. And again, you find them in Buddhist architecture as well as in Hindu architecture. So uh, many symbols or many um, uh, motifs are actually shared as, across uh, different religious architectures. This is one of the best examples of uh, Apsara from Cham Art, uh, who is holding this ge gesture of what is called the Gaja Hasta Mudra. So she actually uh, is um, showing, uh, it's a frozen mo movement. She's doing actually the movement of the flapping of the ear and the movement of the trunk of the elephant. So it's a frozen movement called the Gaja Hasta movement, which uh, has um, an important connection with classical dance in South India. Durga, I was asking about the importance of Mother Goddess uh, yesterday uh, to Dr. Sam, and also I want to highlight that um, Durga has a very prominent place in Southeast Asia in the early period as the uh, individual deity. So she is not a consort of uh, Shiva, but she has a very prominent role as the killer of the Mahisha, Mahisha or the Asura in the form of a um, um, buffalo. So this actually is an important uh, representation from 7th, 8th uh, century, uh, again in Cham, of Durga with multiple arms. Uh, of course, the, the Mahisha is missing, but you can see that it's a celebration of the uh, proclaiming the uh, victory of the mother concept or the mother goddess. And this is another example uh, of architecture, which I think I can skip. How are we doing with time? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I'm moving on to more examples of um, Durga, uh, starting with uh, the uh, Lakshmi and Durga, starting with uh, Funan period, which is where the iconographies of most of the Hindu gods like Shiva, Vishnu, Durga um, get concretized. And this is yet an unusual example of Durga standing on the um, uh, head of Mahisha. And so this is something that I thought would be very, uh, it's this particular statue. So this is something very, what we call, it's a very summary or a very synoptic uh, way of uh, catching the, uh, or representing the iconography, which the Funan artists have captured very, very um, uh, cleverly. So they are, they are, they are not uh, adding too many uh, details, but they are trying to capture the iconography such that you can identify w what the deity is. And you can also see that sculpturally, they are still very unsure. So even these two arms are supported by supports and the two arms above the head are also supported by uh, supports, uh, which are coming out of the actual rock from which the sculpture has been carved. So it is also something to note how early sculptures um, or sculptors have overcome the challenges of trying to capture and uh, depict um, Hindu iconography. And then, of course, in um, Indonesia, we have the most prominent uh, Javanese uh, Durgas, um, which uh, I think there are more than 100 Durgas uh, across Central Java and Eastern Java. So we have here two prominent examples of Mahishasura Mardini uh, Durga. So you can see she's standing on the buffalo and the, the demon has actually emerged outside. So you see the demon and you also see the buffalo. And uh, fortunately, the buffalo's head has not been cut up. Um, but you can see uh, the, the, the demon has already emerged and is already accepting her uh, power and her authority. Yeah, more uh, Vishnu's from the Punan period. Uh, here, the conical cap of Vishnu is very important uh, as an identification marker uh, because in most of the early sculptures, whether it is in Thailand or in Funan or in uh, pre-Angkorian period, you only find the, co the conical cap as the uh, marker of Vishnu. 
because in the case of Shiva, he will have the matted hair. So you can easily identify the Shiva and Vishnu by the headgear. Uh, this is a beautiful Vishnu and this is uh, Avalokiteshwara which I bring here to point out the fact that there are also similarities between Avalokiteshwara and Shiva. So I'm slowly moving into the composite iconographies which you find in uh, Southeast Asia where Shiva, Vishnu combine together as Harihara and Shiva and Bodhisattva combine together to form different forms of Avalokiteshwara. <clears throat> so he has the uh, tiger skin, he has the matted hair, he has rosary. These are all attributes of Shiva which are taken by Avalokiteshwara. So many different things are happening in Southeast Asian iconography which is very unique to the region, be it Funan or be it uh, Cham or be it um, uh, Central Java. Yeah, more elaborate <coughs> um, Vishnus and uh, sorry, one more Ganesha came here from Thailand. Yeah, this is from Thailand. Uh, and I wanted to uh, highlight the importance of uh, importance of Vishnu as Fra Narai, the Narayana concept of Vishnu emerging, uh, so which is related to the Vishnu as the Sheshashai, the one who is uh, reclining in the ocean. And this is a, a, a concept that is going to evolve uh, again in a later part in Thailand, uh, where Ramayana is going to become popular and Rama, Rama uh, God uh, Praram is associated with Narai, the Narayana form of Vishnu. So this is the iconography that is slowly evolving uh, towards uh, the importance of the avatars of Vishnu, such as Rama in later Thai uh, culture. Um, more beautiful um, uh, Vishnus, and here I want to highlight the uh, concept of Harihara, the composite image of Vishnu and Shiva. So you can see if you look closely, one half is Shiva and the other half is Vishnu. And how do you tell? By the headgear. So this is a very clear example. This is the Vishnu side, this is the Shiva side. This is the Vishnu side, this is the Shiva side. How do you tell? by the iconography. So here you have the Shankha, which is the attribute of Vishnu, and here is the trident, which is the attribute of Shiva. Again here you have Chakra, the discus, and Trishula uh, for Shiva, and again the matted hair. Again here Shankha and Gada, uh, which is the mace, and the conch shell, which is the Vishnu, and this is trident, which is Shiva. More examples of uh, Lakshmi, goddess of wealth. This is the second Hindu goddess I'm talking about. The first we mentioned was Durga. So now the goddess of wealth is also associated with Vishnu and with uh, the ocean and the fertility and vegetation associated with the ocean uh, and sustenance, water as the power of sustenance. So Lakshmi is the spouse of Shiva, uh, of Vishnu. And in Angkor architecture, you see very, very close association of nature as well as Hindu iconography fused together in the uh, representation and the decoration of the surfaces of the temples. And this is Kala head or what we call Kirti Mukha or the face of victory, which is a unique iconography in uh, Southeast Asia, which has been amplified uh, way beyond its original purpose in Hindu architecture in India. So I want to highlight that also. So it is the face of uh, time and it's also the face of victory and it's an auspicious symbol which is always found even yesterday in the Balinese instruments uh, and even the dais that we had yesterday. We saw the Kala head everywhere. And Apsara is again a very important uh, concept it's, a, it's not a god, goddess. Apsara is a celestial figure, and they are also associated with water, fertility, and uh, with auspiciousness. And again, in this representation from Angkor Wat, you can see it is very closely linked with nature. So they are also emerging from a lotus that is emerging from the water, 
and they are dancing on the lotus. And when you look at the, uh, some of the texts, this is exactly how the text describes how uh, Apsara originates. So there's sometimes very close connection with the text and sometimes there's a complete um, deviation from it or variation from it. Um, more representations of Apsaras, which uh, again you can see have very elaborate uh, costumes and uh, they are also holding vegetation. So Apsara's connection with nature is very important, be it in Southeast Asia or in South Asia. And there are many different types of uh, dancing Apsaras wearing various costumes and very unique uh, hair, hairstyles. And I just bring the example of uh, the dancers dressed in costumes which have direct relation with uh, sculpture. So here in the revival of uh, Khmer dance after Khmer Rouge, there's a close uh, reference taken by the revivalists uh, from the sculptural um, representations in Angkor Wat as to how this dance will, uh, dancers will look like and how this dance will evolve and survive for the future. Whereas in the context of South Asia, we find the dancers, the Apsaras, are actually dancers. And here you'll find they are always accompanied by musicians. So the Madanikas or the Apsaras from South Asia are actually reflections of dance in art. Whereas in Khmer, for example, the dance is, is inspired by sculpture. So there are very, very interesting uh, similarities, but also differences, uh, which uh, I thought is very important to highlight. And um, in, in uh, context of Odissi dance, which is very close to uh, Southeast Asia, Orissa, uh, we have uh, the example of sculpture, which has very close uh, link with the um, costume uh, designed by the contemporary Odissi classical dancers. So how there's a very close association with uh, dance practice and dance as represented in art. Because what is represented in art is actually a frozen moment of what was practiced at that time. Because the artists would have used models from around them of what was happening around them. I end with uh, the, uh, a theme from uh, uh, Bhagwat. Uh, of churning of the ocean, uh, sorry, Vishnu Puran, churning of the ocean, which has taken on a very important uh, significance in Southeast Asia from Angkor Wat all the way in the 12th century, uh, where the concept of devas and danavas or the, the good over evil, the, the, the victory of good over evil continues even in Buddhist architecture. So this is from Angkor Thom, where you find a long uh, causeway of uh, nagas uh, being uh, pushed or being pulled by uh, the the gods and the demons, gods on one side and the demons on the other. So this is the god side and this is the demon side or the Danava side. So again, the concept of the churning of the ocean, which emphasizes the importance of the good, uh, the victory of good over evil, uh, being actually carried forward all the way into uh, a national icon in in Thailand. It's something that uh, we, we, we find very unusual coming from India, that this can never happen in India. But we are very delighted to see that uh, this uh, so-called uh, concept or mythology or uh, a shared heritage uh, still exists in contemporary uh, Thailand and in contemporary Southeast Asia. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>